welcome to worship on this 21st Sunday after Pentecost. We're so happy that you're worshiping with us this morning, and thank you for joining in as we spend some time set apart for God this morning. We have a great activity happening after church this morning, our pumpkin carving event for our families with tweens and youth um, are getting together at 1230 this Sunday uh, following our worship. Remember that this Sunday is our first offering of an indoor service back in our sanctuary. So those of you who are tuning in online, we're glad that you're with us and we will continue to provide this online worship format for you. For those who choose to come and try out worshiping in the sanctuary, be sure that you watch the little short video piece that explains some of the steps that we're asking everyone to take to help keep all of us safe as we do come and gather, if you choose, in our sanctuary for worship. If you do worship with us in person and want to come to those in-person services, do note that we will be shifting the time of that service to 10 a.m. So again, um, in future weeks, if that might be something you'd like to do, there you go. Do you continue to remember that Thanksgiving blessings request that you are invited to reflect and offer a list of some things that you feel gratitude or thankfulness for? or to share a story, maybe even a Thanksgiving recipe or a story from your family that you might want to share. All of those things that you offer to us will be compiled. Remember that you have until the first week of November to submit those, and then we will be putting all of that together and then sharing it out with y'all as a gift of the Thanksgiving season in the middle of November. We continue to offer prayers to be with the family of uh, Pat Yount um, after the death of her husband Bob on October the 11th. We also continue to lift up those who are recovering from various orthopedic surgeries that have happened in the last month or more. Uh, remember Sheila Lennon, Eddie Boyce, Pete Zimmerman, and Chris Hyatt in these days as they are all recovering and working through their various stages of physical therapy in this time. And now we enter into this time of worship through the music of our prelude.
we join our voices in calling ourselves to worship through the words of Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. In, In you, you, we come home to rest, to wrestle, to love, to be loved. We dwell in you. Before the mountains were born, before you delivered the whole world, from everlasting past to everlasting future, you are God. In you, we are home. We dream, we flourish, we fade, we rejoice. We dwell in you. We join our voices in praying together the Liturgy for Reconciliation this morning. Found on page 13 in the hymnal or through the slides that are on your screen. Almighty God, enthroned above all, you alone are God over the nations of the earth. Even the planets, the stars, and the galaxies are placed by your hand. Where, Where could, could we, we go, go from, from your spirit? spirit? Where, Where could, could we, we flee, flee from, from your presence? presence? If we if go up to the heavens, heavens you are there. there. If we, we go, go down, down into, into the caves of the earth or the, or the depths, depths of the, of the sea, sea, you, you are there. there. God of all creation, we sing praises to your name. We stand jubilant before your glory, power, and beauty. God of certainty, God of truth, our confidence is in you and in you alone. Yet we live in a fallen world and we are an imperfect people. Our world is filled with pain and alienation. We know of illness when body or mind is failing and the loneliness of spirit it brings. We know, we know of separation from parent or child, from friend or neighbor, and the emptiness of life it brings. We know of strangeness in new communities and in changing communities and the longing it brings. We know of alienation caused by unemployment or poverty or discrimination and the, and the pain, pain it brings. We have become strangers to our relatives and foreigners to our own families. How, How can, can we, we sing, sing the Lord's song, song in a strange, strange land? land? Let our, our cry for help, help come, come to you. you. I am a God nearby, says the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth? I am the Lord your God. I have called you out from the peoples and you shall be holy to me. We, we declare, declare your praise, praise the, the one who, who called us out, out of darkness into your wonderful light. We, we are, are a chosen, chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to you. Sing praise to God who reigns above the God of Thank you. 
gracious God, we humbly confess that we walk in the way of the indifferent, who depend on their strength alone. We sit among the scornful, who deny the need for your guidance and power. Our hearts are not satisfied with riches vulnerable to moth and rust and thief, yet we zealously store up those very treasures, set our minds on things unseen and eternal, that our emptiness within may be filled. We humbly confess that we fail to welcome the stranger among us. We pass by the neighbor who is hungry and thirsty, naked, sick, and in prison. We sing of your healing power and your unconditional love but we fail to make our sanctuaries true havens for the suffering and the exiled. Give us the will to be ambassadors for our Savior and faithful stewards of the ministry of reconciliation entrusted to us. Lord, have mercy on us. Amen. Without Christ, we were strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus. We, who were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He is our peace. We, we are, are no longer strangers and aliens, but citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, with Christ himself as the cornerstone. Therefore, let us affirm our faith in the triune God, we believe, we believe in the, in the one, one God who has, who has created the land and sea and heavens and all that is in them, who established, established a world that was good, who gives to us the task of watchful and responsible care over it, who is certainty and truth. We believe in the one God who in Jesus Christ assumed our humanity and knew our life as child, youth, and adult, who dined with sinners and lived with the homeless, who confronted popular opinion and power, who remained obedient in temptation and suffering, whose triumph was a servant's death and resurrection. We believe in the one God who comes to us as comforter and advocate, who does not leave us as orphans, who brings peace and who calms, calms the troubled, troubled heart. heart. He, bestows he bestows gifts for serving, healing, showing compassion, and doing miracles. He alone is the power and the wisdom of our proclamation. Let us in faith keep our eyes fixed on the promises of God, though we see them and greet them from a distance. We confess, we confess that, that we are strangers and foreigners on the earth a people who are seeking our true home. We desire a better place. That is a heavenly one. Indeed, God has prepared a city for us. Let, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Oh, 
last Sunday, we continued on in our Exodus narrative. And this week, we shift back into our Matthew reading that we've been moving through. The two are linked because here in the passage that we hear from Matthew today, we hear about these commandments that Moses has been receiving and sharing with the people of God. Let's hear the text from Matthew 22, verses 34 through 46. When the Pharisees heard that he, Jesus, had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give Jesus an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. This is the word of the Lord. Now, in a few weeks, we'll pick back up with those Beatitudes because I want to keep working our way through that story. But today, we have this story of Jesus about the most important commandment. Now, what we know is that there were so many important things that happened in that city of Jerusalem that sometimes we need a little piece of it with us to help us remember all the things that happened there. Now, every year... The people of God would travel up to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of the Passover, to be reminded of the ways that God led them through those waters to freedom. And every year, Jesus and his family and his disciples, they would travel to Jerusalem to celebrate that feast. That's why Jesus and his disciples are there at the temple that day. Jesus, this year, when he entered Jerusalem, created a stir. When he entered, everyone noticed, and everyone was asking, Who is this man? Who is Jesus? Now, as was often the custom of those who were coming and traveling with those who were their disciples... Jesus had brought his disciples and come here to the Temple Mount to teach them. Jesus was here with some of his disciples. And there were some among the chief priests and the elders who had come also to hear what Jesus might have to say. They were looking for ways that they might trick Jesus They really wanted to see him arrested and killed. They kept asking, Jesus, who gave you the authority to do what you do and to say what you say? They kept on questioning him. And then one of the teachers of the law came and said to Jesus, Of all of these commandments that we have received, all those ten best ways to live that Moses has given to us, which of them is the most important? 
And Jesus answered him and said, The most important commandment is this. Our God is one. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your spirit, with all your mind, with all your strength. There is a second one, though. The second is this. We're to love God. And we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. There is no greater commandment than these. And they both remind us of the ways that God loves us in all that we do and all that we are. The scribe, that lawyer who came to question Jesus, said, you are right. God is one. To love God with all our heart and all our understanding and all our strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves is more important than any of our burnt offerings and sacrifices. Jesus said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. From that time on, no one questioned any of the things that Jesus had to say. I wonder, how do you think it might feel to be Jesus? having everyone question why you're able to do the things that you do or who gives you the authority to act in those ways. I wonder how the people of Jerusalem, who haven't spent time with Jesus the way that he did in the Galilee, I wonder what they feel as they hear Jesus teach. I wonder how those disciples and the crowds of friends and supporters that come with them, I wonder how they feel when so many are questioning Jesus. This parable this teaching of Jesus, well, it's all about how we center our lives. Do we center our lives in this love that God asks from us and the love that God asks for us to share with others and the ways that we get the strength to do all of this because God first loves us? Let us reflect on that as we share in this time of offertory reflection.
always helpful to remember where Jesus quotes from when he quotes scripture, because this really truly is a quote, quote that comes straight out of the book of Leviticus. Now you've got the Shema, the Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It comes from Deuteronomy and shows up in a couple of variations in other places. But our text for that loving your neighbor isn't a new invention of Jesus. It comes straight out of Leviticus in chapter 19. So I invite us to hear these words from the law that Moses received. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Then we skip over to verse 15. You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people. And you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor, or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together as we enter into this time of sermon reflection. This day, may I sleep beneath your feet, O Lord of the mountains and the valleys. You who are ruler of the trees and the vines, let me rest in your love. With you protecting each of us as a father protects his children. With you watching over all of us as a mother watches over her children. Then, Tomorrow the sun will rise and I will not know where I am, but I will know, we will know that you will guide our footsteps. Working with these commandments, I'm reminded of a book that I read a number of years ago by Terry Tempest Williams. And it's titled, Finding Beauty in a Broken World. Now, the focus of her book is not explicitly about love, but it is in this text where she bears witness to a distinctly courageous kind of love. The kind of love that we need to have in a time like this. What she describes is not a love that has the glossy sheen or the myth of perfection, but one that decidedly takes note of and is aware that love can best be known in taking time to appreciate the brokenness of life and the ways that we need one another and God to heal that brokenness. Throughout the text, she reflects on her apprenticeship in a mosaic workshop. Those mosaic pieces of art that have all the tiny little tessela that are cut and shaped in a variety of colors to form an image. Sometimes those little bits of glass and stone are just what you would expect. And sometimes They are put together in a configuration that up close doesn't seem like anything at all, but from a distance becomes miraculously beautiful, evocative. 
She explores in her book how life is much like that mosaic piece of art made of all those little pieces. She shares that the master mosaicist that she's learning under, Luciana, shares with her the idea that once you learn the rules of how ancient mosaics are constructed, only then can you break them. What if this is true with these rules of love that we find ourselves presented with in Matthew? Only once we have deeply learned these rules of love can we begin to break or reinterpret them, adding our own meanings into them. These greatest commandments these rules of love can pretty easily trip off of our tongues if we grew up in the church, attending Sunday school and youth conferences. We're familiar with you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. You shall love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. But while they are simple enough for us to easily commit them to our memories, do we really let them sink down deep into our oldest understandings? Do we let them raise questions about what we define love to be? Many authors ask if maybe we have made love into this relatively unspecified ideal, a vague generality instead of the truly durable and enduring way that it's intended to be in Scripture. Love requires certain actions and internal changes within us in our focus and our self-knowledge. Love is never a vague generality if we're really paying attention. It requires courage for us to commit ourselves to knowing and being known. It requires time, the time that it takes to undertake this work of discovery and knowledge within ourselves and in our interactions with others. It requires the intentionality necessary to build and sustain relationships. It doesn't take for granted that they just simply happen because we move in and out of a place together. If we enter into acts of love without intent toward both our own growing self-awareness and our actions, the reasons behind what we do, and the impacts that our actions have on others, then we are but a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, as we hear in 1 Corinthians. Embodying love for God and love for others is the greatest of challenges. The sheer breadth of these two commands makes obedience to them a lifelong effort for all of us walking this earth. If the command to love God with all our being and to love our neighbors, all of those whom God has surrounded us with, are rules that we are always trying to learn, then maybe we need to remember that we are not yet ready to attempt reinterpreting what's meant by Jesus here. Maybe our task is the constant and courageous commitment of time toward developing an understanding of love as Jesus describes it here. Coming to know love itself requires a commitment of time, whether it is love of God, love of self, or love of others. Hearing these two commandments side by side should help us to understand that we are unable to separate these two halves of one whole. We must learn that we are loved by God so that we are both able to love God and to love anyone else. We cannot simply commit the time to one task of loving without committing equal time to the task of loving the other. Each one feeds and nourishes, strengthens and nurtures the other. 
Love is something that grows out of deep sharing, and such sharing takes time to develop in order for it to come to full bloom. If we're to be the church in such a broken world, if we are able to demonstrate a witness of love that is in no way vague or generalized or unspecific, then we've got to choose to commit ourselves to know love through that shared knowledge and responsibility to care for one another. We must find the courage to commit our time and energy to the task of fully seeing each life that we encounter as we walk through the world. It's about seeing and acknowledging all those shiny outward appearances that we want people to see and all those rough edges and jagged fragments that we hold more carefully within us. The metaphor of mosaic that's found in William's writing expresses a call for slowing down, a reminder of what I believe we all know is somewhere deep within us. What is important in life are the experiences of sharing in love. Those are what we remember, what we crave with the depths of our beings. They're what we know truly matter most, and yet, We so easily find ways to deny ourselves of them. There's always something else demanding our time and our attention and our focus. But when we think about it in terms of mosaics, a mosaic is a conversation between what is broken. All those separate little pieces that have to be framed together to form something new and whole. But those fragments have to be brought together in a time-consuming and patient process to make them sing and harmonize with one another. A mosaic is a conversation with time. We are so often the broken and isolated shards of life and love, wandering and waiting, hoping, but feeling hopeless in our dreaming of something more. Time that's spent in relationship, in shared action and commitment that takes us beyond ourselves in mutual care and appreciation creates in us a deeper and more enduring sense of hope of what's possible because it doesn't all just rely on us one by one. We see a fuller picture of God's love as it is revealed and allowed to shine in each of our lives when we get the opportunity to see all of us framed together having been courageous with our time to find how the pieces just might fit together. It's only when our raw and rough fragments come into community and receive the care that helps us to bind those separate pieces together can we become that beautiful array of a finished mosaic. The love that we are called to is one that asks us to give of our best selves, all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all the strength that we have, and to risk allowing others to then see and support our raw and rough edges. It is what God extends to us as a part of this beloved creation. To know in the depths of our beings that we are beloved even in those rawest and most fragile places It is what God asks of us. Asks of us both to be given back to God and to be given to those with whom we share our world. Adorable and well-worn love that binds us back together by binding us in relationship. This sort of love is well worth such intentionality with our time. If it is given with deep and abiding courage, it is what can reshape our broken world and our broken selves. 
If we are to see the beauty that exists all around us, we have to first be willing to enter into this courageous act of time sharing, time given, vulnerability. There is motion and texture to this life that can only be found when we allow time to be somewhat unbounded every so often. Time for love that is allowed to open up, spread itself out, expanding before our eyes. Time that can be cared for just tenderly enough for us to forget its passage. William suggests that she is learning through this mosaic apprenticeship, learning to trust the motion that comes through color and the spaces in between the pieces. Not in the controlled and static placement of each cube in that mosaic, but in the joy of the odd arrangements and particular unpredictable moves of choice. Placing the unexpected side by side. She says it teaches her to believe in the beauty of all things common. To believe in the beauty of all things broken. Letting go of our controlled uses of time. The boundaries that we want to draw up around what it is to be in a community in Christ. And coming to a realization of the beauty that can only be known when we are willing to let love move in and through our lives in new ways. Not just the ones that are familiar and well-worn. It is the beauty of love that shows up when we allow ourselves to inhabit the time we spend with a different set of sensibilities. This is the workshop of time where we can learn these rules of love by practicing the art of being in relationship. Not just when it's comfortable, but when it is also challenging and reveals our brokenness within it. Hope is born out of such practices of love The last instructions that Luciana, that master mosaicist, taught to her class of apprentices was that mosaic is a way to organize your life. Making mosaics is a way of thinking about the world. Mosaics are created out of community. It's community that requires the kind of courage and intentionality in our time and in our actions and our own self-awareness that allows for the love that is intended by these commandments of God to be lived out. I invite us this morning as we head into our closing prayers to sing together called by Christ to love each other. Not. Okay.
Let us pray together. O oh, Eternal One, it would be so much easier for us to pray to you if we were clear of a single mind and a pure heart. If we could come before you and be done hiding from ourselves and from you, even in our prayers. But we come. We are who we are, filled with a mixture of different motives and excuses. We come as blurs of memories, quiver full of hope, tangled in knots of fear and confusion. We come restless with love for love, seeking ways to know your love that we might share it. And we wander here somewhere between gratitude and grievances, between wonder and a desire for routine. We come with a high resolve or undone dreams. We come filled with generous impulses and unpaid bills. Come and find us, Lord. Be with us exactly as we are and let our lives open and unfold before you. Help us to open our lives that you might help us find ourselves, O oh Lord. Help us to accept what we already are so that we can begin to more fully be yours. Make of us something that is small enough to embrace, young enough to question, light enough to laugh at your irony, and old enough to forget. Hopeful enough that we might act for peace skeptical enough that we might doubt anything but the sufficiency of you and attentive enough for us to listen as you call us out of the places we attempt to hide that we might embrace and come out into the risky glory that your possibilities offer to us O oh, Eternal One, it is said that you created people because you love stories. So be with us as we live out our story with you. Guide us as we work our way intentionally to journey both inward and outward. 
wherever we might be in your path. Let our story be yours. And let us see that by the light of your love that we can find you. Strengthen those who find themselves in sickness. Comfort this day those who are grieving. And embrace us all that we might trust in your abiding presence. May our stories come together in this place and journey out into the world together. This place that is not just one place, but the places wherever we find ourselves connected and in relationship. Strengthened in the love of community and bound together by this love that we might hope. In Christ we come, asking all these things. Amen. Brothers and sisters, help us to keep on believing in the beginnings. Encourage us to make a beginning where there isn't one, to be a beginning. For it is in the love that comes from within you, O oh God, that all things have their beginnings. Move within us, inspire us, begin anew within us. And in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may you bless us and keep us in all these days. May your face rise and shine upon us, and may the grace that we receive Fill us in your love. May your countenance be lifted upon us and give us the deepest of peace. Amen. Amen.